Hello, Manny. It's Monday, and you're back. Yes. Nice. I got, some, I got my full seven hours last night, so I'm ready Did to you? go. Did you? Wow. Yeah. I I can't think of the last time I got seven hours sleep, man. That's impressive. Oh, on a Sunday night, I watched the uh, Squid Game like last couple episodes, and that was like time for bed. I have not watched that yet. I've heard a lot about it, but I have not watched it. You gotta watch it. It's such a mind. Fun. All right, I'm like years behind. We're we're still on season five of Curb Your Enthusiasm. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know what? It's 2021. So uh, is it? I think- is it? <laughs> all right, good. Well, we've time stamped this for all the people that watch it later, which is good. So, thank you so much for making the time. We were already talking that you don't have a huge amount of time, so we're already looking at a part three. We know that. Yeah. So we're going to get through as much as we can. And I want to uh, just mention before we start that today's been a very weird day and I may have to actually take a phone call, which I would feel incredibly rude doing. And in most circumstances, I wouldn't even know I got a phone call, but it might happen today, in which case Mark will jump in for a sec, ask a couple Listen, questions. And... Mama was calling me too. I, I bound, so no no need to apologize. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's pick it right up where we left off. Where we left off was you going, oh, man, I got to tell you about um, In Vogue. And like, uh, all right, uh, <laughs> so let's start there, shall we? Yes. So in Vogue, so I, I, uh, I was kind of like the, uh, uh, well, I was Babyface's engineer at the time, and I, I think I told you last time where, man, my goal was always to mix. That was my dream. The goal was always, always wanted to mix. But you know, I started recording, you know, as a recording engineer, like all uh, most of us mixers, and. Uh, I, I was at uh, Brandon's Way, which is Babyface's studio on Highland, and uh, he had a, a mixer that he had been working with for forever. So uh, it was Easter Sunday, and uh, this En Vogue track came came along, and uh, I had recorded it, handed off handed it off to the mixer. He mixes it. They weren't crazy about it, and as Babyface is walking out on a, I believe he, it must have been Friday Friday night, he's like. He goes, hey, you want to mix this song over the weekend? You know, it's Easter. I'm going to go to Tahoe or wherever he was going. And I'm like, fuck yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I mixed it, and uh, Sylvia Roan on a Monday calls me. He's like, wait, wait, who are you? What's This is the, this is a great, this is an amazing mix. What We're going to keep this. And here's this kid, right, that uh, was, I didn't even know who Sylvia Roan was at the time. And, uh, and, she, uh, and then that started so many problems with the mixer that, that Kenny had at the time and you know which look I I I completely understand it you have these this kid coming in and now taking a mix that you had done and I'm I'm sure that can be very you know uh not cool for anybody to go through so I totally understand uh don't blame anybody for taking the actions they took and uh from that point on it was kind of hell for me being there and uh and I had an opportunity yeah he put me through hell and then I had an opportunity to uh, go work for the Braxtons, uh, Tony Braxton's sisters, and to make some of that stuff. And I told Kenny, I said, "Look, you know that uh, I, w- I want to pursue that." And uh, and uh, and I went. I never. I think that would, could have been some of my last recording sessions. Uh, wow. From that, from that point on, I just I never looked back. And uh, and it was uh, and uh, you know the mixer and I became you know we were still. I don't know if we're friends, but you know, it was it was all good. But it was a great opportunity for me to impress Babyface and myself and and I remember working on the Easter Sunday. Man, I spent two days on the mix and not knowing what I was really doing, but just following your gut, right? And uh and yeah. that kinda started my not started, but kinda gave me more confidence, you know. It's all it's all it's all about the confidence, right? Yeah, man, that that's awesome, and it's it's also an interesting thing to to touch on while we're here is that there are always people gunning for you, and if yeah. if you lose the gig because someone else's mix was better, man, you can't be mad about that. If you lose it because someone screwed you or talked about you behind your back, like there are plenty of ways a gig can go away that are not cool, but yeah. to lose it purely based on the mix, yeah, it's all fair game. Like you said, yeah, you said it best. We all have this big uh, bullseye on our back and everyone's gunning for that and that's and then the way that's kind of exciting because it's a level playing field you know nowadays a kid in the freaking with a laptop in mom's basement can 
you can compete against someone that's been doing it for almost 30 years mm -hmm. you know? and that's, that's that's an exciting thing for all of us for them and us to stay sharp and and do it because we love to do it not because you know not because we have the seniority of you know of being able to do it just because we've been doing it forever so it's a level playing field which is great yeah yeah absolutely man i i that's uh but that that's really interesting that that sort of ended your time with babyface at the yeah. at that yeah. time but you know i mean moving on to the braxton's it's not terrible is it it's pretty good no, no, i got lucky man it was like you know met some good producers that they were doing some great records and we're all young and naive and just wanted to do it for the greater good of you know our careers in the future when audio so uh for me it's like you know i was just dedicated i was really focused i was there's only one thing i wanted to do and that's that was mixed records i don't you know didn't matter what records they were just wanted to be in you know be in the studio working on artist music you know that was my dream well and I, i've been thinking a lot about something you said the last time which was that when you used to go to guitar center and mess around with the four track but that yeah. you would you would say, okay, I'm going to mix this so it makes me happy. All right, now I'm going to mix it so it makes me angry. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. that's, it's like, you can't tickle yourself, you know? Like, I mean, to really, to, to make yourself feel something while mixing, just using EQ on a four track, like, that's pretty badass. Man. And, you know, it's like, I remember, like, Dave Way, back in the day, him and I would talk about emotions and frequencies and all that. And I remember going back to my high school teacher, like, how he, uh, you know, to this day it blows, you know, blows my mind thinking of emotion based on frequencies, which is, you know, it's kind of obvious to a lot of people. But when you really go a lot deeper on how you make the same song have a completely different emotion based on levels and frequencies without touching anything else, without, you know, your stereo bus or getting complicated with processing or gain structure and any of that i mean the power that we have based on frequencies uh, uh, how we can create an emotion that's still really powerful and now we have what we have to do is we have to be invisible right we don't have you know i love when people don't notice who mixed it or any of that we have to be almost like it's got to be what it's going to be and and uh, our job is to kind of be invisible and hopefully create that emotion that that the artists and producer are ultimately looking for and do you have like if you know you want to get a certain kind of emotion out of something do you already have like something in your mind of what that eq is going to look like or is it just you know you're going to get there with eq and that's how you're going to do it i, I, I try to not look at frequencies you know like especially in the world of like great looking GUIs and plugins and you, you got to look for the frequency and stuff and I'm kind of old school where if I'm mixing on a desk if not mix if if when I'm mixing on a desk I just reach for the frequency and I don't even look at it I right. just go motion right and I think that I try to do that with plugins as well uh, you know when we do these seminars panels and stuff we all do them all the time you know the one of the first things I always say is uh, for uh, to give me a facial expression of what 1K means to you, right? And everyone has the same fucking, like, they're all like, Rrr. you know, and then I'm like, give me 100 hertz. They all kind of, kind of go down a little bit, you know, and then give me 10, 10, 10 kilohertz. And I'm like, this. so, you know, that's an emotion. Uh, they're very basic emotions. But if you're telling me that 1K, you do this phase, then yeah, and if I want some aggression, I may go for that. And uh, it's just it's three simple frequencies that you can actually now divide, you know, multiply it by countless, uh, you know, uh, possibilities. Um, I think that's the very basic way to describe for someone that doesn't know what kind of what we do, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Just a really interesting way of looking at it. You know. Yeah. It's, it's different. We, we apply it every single day without you know with. Yeah, without thinking about it. Yeah. All right. So it obviously worked out for you to do this because you were immediately sort of on fire. I mean, there, there's Whitney and Andre Crouch and Mary J. Blige. And like that's within a year and a half of you stopping working for Babyface and not recording anymore. So it really worked out. 
<laughs> it worked out. <laughs> it worked out. You know, it's, it's so funny because I never looked back. I never realized how, you know, not until we have a conversation about it. Uh, but for me, it was just kind of like the tunnel vision, man. The blinders were always on. I was never looking at, never concerned about it, whether competition or what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? I really took the approach of whatever's in front of me. I'm, I'm just going to really, really try to make the best of it. And sometimes I succeeded. Sometimes I didn't, you know, um, and that was the very basic approach. I, I, I didn't know that, oh, my gosh, I'm working with Mary or I'm working with Biggie or, you know, looking back, it's a, it's amazing. And I almost wish I could be back in that moment to kind of, you know, digest th th that moment, you know, and try to remember it and take a photographic memory of, of what that moment. But for me, it was, man, I was just had the blinders on and I would just just wanted to kind of keep going and and try to do the best, you know, the best possible work and so that they could call you back. Right. I mean, I always say we work for our peers, not our, not the fans. Cause if we, if it was for the fans and they would, I think it would be a whole different approach, but I want to impress Jimmy Ivy, you know, so he can call me back to do more projects. Right. So we're working for our peers. Uh, and I always wanted to make sure that, you know, the people that were employing me um, were satisfied. Like, like, I think we, we said it before, like, not that, getting your quote first hit is easy because it's obviously not but you know when the expectations are higher the second third fourth fifth time around that's when it gets really tricky that's when because now the the expectation is not this kid that just happened to do a good mix or you know <laughs> right right and you can never look back at the one that did really well and figure out why and like oh great yeah. i'll just do that again like you know like you said you're only as good as your last hit and it's uh you know Rose from uh, from Record Plant would always say that, and she would always say, "You're only as good as your client." <laughs> yeah. And amen to that. Yeah, absolutely right. You could be doing the best mixes in the world for someone who sells four records, and only yeah. four people know about it. And my advice was always, if I am doing that, I'm going to try to take bigger chances, so that hopefully, when I do get that big artists I'm able to now apply some of the things and some of the fuck ups that I've done to other records that actually worked <laughs> you know <laughs> it was like the testing so I never saw you know interesting enough I never saw a record you know someone like that wasn't gonna sell or at the time to me was always like okay it's like going to college and and this is your part of your you know curriculum to to be able to practice on some of these mixes and and I, I gotta say early in my career I practiced on a lot of Japanese records I mean I like we were saying no one heard them and that DSing was like the art of DSing at the time uh, I learned how to DS from Japanese records you know um, and stuff like that so I think it's just be, being you know just having a good attitude right I, I think that we always talk about the technical side and and how we the emotional side as well but also just as a as a human being, yeah. <laughs> if you're a human being, I don't know if a lot of people are going to fuck with you, you know? Exactly. People have to want to hang, especially back then, because everybody was in the room. Now, you could be a total asshole and mix like crazy. You know, it's like, <laughs> that old, that always comes out eventually, even if you're not in the room, because now email etiquette is like what what used to be, you know, yeah. a student back in the day. Like, if you don't have good email etiquette, <laughs> like, you better learn how that, you know? Yeah. Yep, always find something positive to lead with. Yeah, I mean, listen, we're so blessed to be in the studio, man. I mean, come on. This is like, there's, again, there's, even on the worst day, we're still we're still doing okay, you know? We're, yeah. we're doing what we, we love to do, and that to me is a is true success, you know? Well, all right, so you make this transition. You're now mixing all the time, and you're working. I'm assuming that a lot of the work was coming because it was with the same producers, right? Different artists, but same producers. Yeah, it was, you know, like I said earlier, Solshank and Carlin were very instrumental. Chuck, Chucky Thompson's the Rest in Peace was great. Puff was great as well. Mario Winans. So I was starting to meet a lot of different types of producers. Warren Campbell, Dutch. Uh, I mean, they, you know, just kind of got in with them and uh and babyface as well so um you know i was kind of just being a, in the the right place at the right time you know uh and uh 
it was just like it kind of just spread you know like people at the time were looking for if you i don't know at the time there was a lot of mixers that were just older mixers you know maybe it was a transition when you know r&b started taking over the charts and, yeah you know listen a 60 year old mixer may not you know may not have the same sort of reaction that say the like KD and I were like the youngest guys at the time. I remember us always competing, and we're listen, we're good friends, and and we. Uh, but it was probably the healthiest competition with KD because we were in the same building and just down the hall from each other, and we were mixing a ton of like cool, like up and coming and established R and B, uh, and and I think uh, you know again I was at the right place at the right time where I feel like there was a transition. Uh, of like, hey, let's see what some new cats can do. Yeah, you know? there were there were a couple of people that managed to stick around, like Barney Perkins stuck around, like nothing had ever happened. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a lot of them did kind of go, and I think the same thing happened in the in the rock genre, like in all the genres. There was sort of a change over there as the technology caught up too. There were a lot of engineers who just couldn't get their heads around having to run Pro Tools or whatever. That killed a lot of careers. Yeah, a lot of great engineers. Yeah, when you couldn't afford to have a separate Pro Tools guy. Yep. And you know, and I think that that teaches us being open minded too. Like I remember back then, there were some engineers where they're like, "Oh man, this sounds like shit. I'm never gonna trans. I'm never ever very grumpy old dudes." And I sound like that now, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was um, they didn't embrace it, you know, and uh, and. Uh, man, it moved really quick. Within a, a year or two, half the engineers that were around, you know, were non-existent, you know? They yep. couldn't transition. So I think that was a big thing, too, if you were able to transition. And it and listen, it didn't sound, I mean, still has a different sound. But, you know, just like anything, there's an evolution. And we were talking about Atmos, how it's going to evolve eventually. Um, you might as well embrace it and take a look at it and see what it could do maybe not right the second but how you can grow with that technology yeah absolutely look and there are some astounding records made on really early digital technology i mean if you think trevor horn wasn't making good sounding records you're deaf exactly exactly and that's yeah. late 80s early 90s you know yeah. and the way you're able to color too i always say like when you're coloring you know Hey, what converters do you like? I'm like, fuck, you know, I'm my ears are gonna adapt and adjust to that yeah. sound anyway. So I mean, I, I hate the sound, <laughs> that, but give me whatever converter. Uh, let me let me fuck with it. Look, any knob you turn in that studio does more than the difference in the converters. Exactly. And look, some are better, absolutely. And if I were capturing hi-fi stuff, yeah, I'd good, care good, a good. lot more. But people have heard Art. my mixes; they know it. They know I don't care. You can have an amazing Honda, and you can have an amazing, you know, AMG, whatever, 500 SL, whatever, Mercedes. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, yeah, you can see that one is may, maybe better than the other, but they all do the same thing. They'll take you from, you know? <laughs> so that's what, to me, that's what a good converter is. Great. I'll take the 500 SL. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, yeah. But if I had to, I can also drive the really cool t Toyota Camry, you know? <laughs> Yeah, if you're going to lunch, you want lunch. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let let's talk about this era a little bit because I mean, like in in the year 2000, which is like three years after you split from Babyface, you mm -hmm. mixed tons of records. I should have counted them and written it down, but all it says in my notes is tons of records, <laughs> and a lot of it is is the stuff you're talking about. But there's also like there's the Pink record in there. Was that her first record? That was her first record. Yep, yep. So how'd that one come about? I was going to Atlanta a lot, working with Noontime, uh, and those guys were great. Uh, and then I had a, uh, you know, Brian Cox, Donnie Scant, and uh, some of the those uh, producers, um, uh, Brains. Uh, that was his name. That uh, so, anyways, they were doing a lot of really up cool up and coming producers that. Uh, you know, worked on Pink, uh, and I know I'm not sure. I think Soling Cardin might have worked on that. I'm not really sure, but I was going to Atlanta a lot to do a lot of records there, mix a lot of records, and uh, and there there was this artist named Pink, and uh, and she was, you know, when she was starting, it was kind of like a very R&B urban heavy record, and if you look, if you listen to it, it's completely different from she. I love how she's evolved, 
but it was you know it was very very early in uh and that was la, la face and uh la was a big believer in you know like face you know and and some of the again some of these young up-and-coming producers and and again i just happened to be in that mix and uh and i ended up gosh i don't remember how many songs i worked on that uh i worked on a lot but uh, i think i mixed oh, gosh i can't even tell you how many songs but but that was cool it was a great uh great experience going to atlanta and getting to know all those guys from 112 again mario Winans, and and brains and all the guys i mentioned i mean i'm sure i'm, I'm forgetting a ton of them but and I'm, and Dave Way was going there a lot too. Is that did you guys hang out there? Or no, I never saw him out there. But I know he was going out there with you know the same camp. He might have been going a little earlier, maybe a few years. Right. Yeah. Know. Well, because he is super old. You know. He is super old. <laughs> He's got to be what ninety five, ninety two. Oh, at least, at least. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, but Dave Way, man, shout outs to Dave. He's such a good guy. Such yeah. a good. Guy. Yeah, and I, I actually met him in Atlanta. I was doing a session down there, and he, oh, wow. he was so nice and so helpful, and yeah. Yeah, Man, that's that's what, that's what I'm talking about. There's so many good guys that, you know, that we unfortunately don't get to see us often, but, you know, uh, but they're great. They're great, great mentors and just pe people in general. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there were some cool studios in Atlanta. So, you know, so, uh, was the uh, – did you work at the uh, – What's the place where uh, Brandon O'Brien used to? Uh, no, no. Um, I know. Audio. The audio. Uh, oh gosh. Anyways. It, my something few... tracks. Um... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, anyway, the, the scene was pretty cool. Very exciting, and we used to go to Miami too. Like so, the Atlanta scene, of course, New York. I mean, that was like where the hub was at the time, and I was going there a ton. I was pretty much by coastal. It seemed like for years. Because all the label labels were there, so they all kind of wanted to show up at the end of the mix and approve mixes and all that. So you know, for for a lot, for years, I was kind of bi coastal. I was you know going yeah going back and forth with Drew Hill, a, a lot of Drew Hill stuff. Uh, and again, Dutch was producing a lot of that with Kenneth Creer managing them. Um, and yeah, we would go to New York and do a ton of things. And uh, yeah, that was a great scene, man. Like back in Hit Factory days when. The lobby was probably the hottest lo lobby out of any studio I've ever been to where you saw everyone. There's, of course, there's 3,000 platinum records on the wall, you know, from floor to ceiling. It was, as a 20 at this point now, I'm like 23, 24 maybe. Uh, man, it was just the most impressive studio. And then you have Mariah Carey in one room. You have Boyz II Men in another. I mean, these were the biggest artists at the time. Uh, and Puff, of course, you know, and his whole crew. So, uh, you know, it was it was a great time. Great, great time. The, the, my, definitely my golden age when I was, you know, like very impressed by all of that. Man. Right. And I was going to ask you if you started to have like specific rooms you wanted to mix in at that point. Were you kind of narrowing that down or was it like, give me an SSL and whatever? Yeah, you know, back in, yeah, back then it was like, you know, we all ha had racks and we all moved everywhere. And at the time, I mean... Listen, there were maybe 75 studios in L.A. I remember when I sent my resume back when I was like 18, and there was, there was at least 75 big studios. I think in L.A. there may be less than 10 now, right? Um, yeah. So, so there were, you know, so people would look for better deals and look for a room. And so it was very common to to kind of jump, jump around, right? Uh, so uh, I never really had a room. And then, and then finally I was like, fuck, I need to really... I'm working enough that I can keep a room going, you know, and uh, and I remember that feeling. I was at Skip Sailors uh, over on Large Largemont, and then I remember Record Plan because Record Plan was the hub. That to me maybe the um, West Coast hit factory. Right. So um, I wanted to be at Record Plan, so we used to book it a lot. And finally, I got my room there, and uh, you know, and then. Uh, you know, I was there for maybe for a couple of years. And which room and were you in? I was in SSL, well, let's see, SSL 2. So the one on the right, like halfway down the hall. Yep, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would go between SSL 1 and SSL 3, which is the one in the back by the pool table. Yeah, like which, I, just to go on a tangent, that room always felt like it was facing the right way, and the other ones always felt like not right. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, listen, Record Plant was an interesting place because you did never, I mean, honestly, you never went there for the sound of the rooms. You never went there for the quality of the equipment. Uh, bros just knew how to run the studio and you, you went and they would put the name of the artist on the, uh, you know, on the door and like you see Mariah Carey with the engineer and you felt like you had a ride, you know, nowadays you, I would, you know, that that would never work today. Right. Uh, social media, but, but it was, I mean, I just wanted to be in that environment, you know, and again, the, the equipment always, always kind of never worked. And <laughs> the tech, I remember the tech being kind of a jerk and it was just, the scene, I think, more than anything. So. Yeah, well, I mean, in that place had been a scene since the 70s, even before it moved into that building. I mean, I remember a, a friend of mine was an engineer there back back in the day, and when he was an assistant, his gig was to go out at 2 a.m. when the clubs were closing and bring girls back. I mean, <laughs> a horrible, horrible thing to even say out loud now, but, you know, back then it was like, you get that hot tub full for 2.30. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking hell. Well, when I was there, there was a... Uh... A, uh, a a transvestite club across the street. Yes. So I don't to do that yeah, yeah, big, big time, big time, and then it burned down over. No, yeah, the zone. I was the so zone. mean. And, uh, all the new uh, GAs over there and ask uh, for the number five special with a milkshake. And, right. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it was really weird. Right across the street was that, which was a gigantic club, and then like the technical bookstore in LA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it was weird. But you know, it was a great place to be at, and uh, yeah. And that I moved to Track and Place, uh, which was, you know, Babyface's. Uh, Babyface bought that building, the old so so solar building on Kawenga, and uh, since uh, Randy Cohen, my manager, was kind of ha- started a publishing company with uh, Tracy Edmonds, which was Kenny you know, Babyface's wife at the time, called Yabium. Uh, he, he kind of did a split on the management as well. So I, you know, I took over one of those rooms, which was, which was great because that was a, the very first room that was that I could call my room. You know, right? Great, great, great days, man. Great, amazing days. Uh, and then, yeah, and then I was there for you know, I'll tell you this how I ended up at Larry. Uh, so we uh we had just finished an album. It was like 13, 14 songs, and uh, we would always uh, open up, uh, go get some wine, right? At ear break, we would print it on the CD, go drive around in the car and make notes. We go to the store, and we always would get a uh, Chardonnay, chilled Chardonnay, and a and a and a red. But since we had finished the album, we got this really nice bot, this Bordeaux, really good bottle, right? And uh, so we went back. Yeah, we left the wine in the lounge and then we brought the white wine because we're drinking as we're making some final changes to the song. But we uh, opened the, the red one to let some air into it, right? Uh, we're airing it out. So so we order some, some food, dinner, so we're going to have the wine while we ate. And that, that was sort of the ritual when we finished albums, with, especially with Soul Shock. So we uh, go to, in the lounge and, you know, maybe one third of the wine was gone. And we're like, <laughs> How, how the fuck does that happen, right? So we see one of the GAs walking around with a, a, a solo cup, and him and his girl, and then he's obviously impressing the girl because he's giving giving her a tour of the studio, right? And I'm like, hey, man, is that our wine from the lounge? It's like, oh, no. And of course it was, right? So <laughs> the next day I had to go to New York, and I was uh, my assistant at the time. He had never been in New York, so it was a big deal for him. So I always say when you're first time in New York, you got to do the silly two, you know, the double decker bus, right? You got to do it because it kind of gives you a feel for the whole city, you know. So I'm on the I'm on the freaking double decker bus with them, and I'll never forget. I called the studio manager. I'm like, hey, uh, you know, um, so and so kind of took the liberty and drank, you know, a big, you know, big chunk of our of our. Bordeaux and it wasn't cheap but you know with wine you know you just all you have to do is ask we would have shared you know with him but the fact that he denied it is kind of you know kind of bothering me and I'm I remember looking up and we're right at the bottom of the Empire State Building right and then and then she said well I talked to him and he he did not it, it, he didn't do it I'm like I go look I'm pretty sure there's no other lounge there's no other wine i mean you know look i don't want to get him in trouble but at least 
you know, I just thought you'd want to know that this guy, you know, and she completely denied everything and took his side. He's like, no, no, he will never do this. That's my guy, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at, I was getting really frustrated looking at the building. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's the Empire State Building. Oh, cool. At that moment, I hung up and called Larrabee. And uh, Jamie was the studio manager. I'm like, Jamie, I'm about to leave the studio because, you know, they're so unprofessional. And not that I wanted someone to buy me wine, but at least just apologize. Just yeah, say, yeah, hey. just be honest. Yeah. And she goes, I have a room for you. And that that was the beginning of my residency here at Larrabee. And uh, and I never looked back, never went back. And uh, Wow. And was, yeah. And, and to me, now Larrabee at the time was... That's where like Record Plant was an artist friendly studio because they had they had a button for a client service and like you said, you can pretty much get anything. Larrabee was the complete opposite. It felt very thorough, felt like uh like you're going to the dentist in the hallways and it, but the, the equipment always worked. They had the best equipment outboard and the rooms sounded so good and all the great mixers that I'd looked up to had gone through Larrabee at some point. So that was sort of my dream to be at Larrabee. Uh, and, uh, and that was the opportunity to leave. And Jamie's like, yep, we have a room. And that was gone. <laughs> so right. thank you. Thank you, runner, for drinking my wow. wine. And on a double-decker bus in Midtown. And I love it because it, it sounds, it's only because I've been watching Curb Your Enthusiasm lately, but it, it's exactly like Larry David going all the way across the country. He's with somebody, you're sightseeing, but... I'm just going to call about that wine. It's, <laughs> it's just bothering me. And then look into their eyes, you know. Oh, man. Well, and and always Larrabee North. You always wanted to be in the building you're in now, no, or you would have been okay? In... Yeah. I had done a ton of sessions at Larrabee West, like some of those early Drew Hill, uh, Warren G. And, right, and that's know. where Dave was as well, right? Yes, exactly. And then Dave was also an... an you know, Larrabee North, and the KD was here. The first time, uh, uh, my studio here, Studio Two, I, uh, you know, at the time we we're talking about being at different studios everywhere from New York, Miami, Atlanta, here in LA, and so I've been to a lot of rooms. So um, we were doing Usher, uh, My Way with Tricky Stewart, and we were at uh, Brandon's Way. Uh, so this is going back a few years. Uh, and uh, and oh yeah, Tricky's like, oh, let's 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 go out tonight. Let's you know, let's just go to a club or whatever. I'm like, yeah, cool, let's go. Get in the car. It's like, oh, we're gonna pick up a friend of mine. Do you know KD? I'm like, yeah, KD, of course. So uh, we pull up at Larrabee and uh, and we walk down to Studio Two. And I will never forget, never forget this feeling when I walked into that room. Like it just took my breath away. It just took everything. It was love at first sight. And I never felt that about a room, you know? And from that point on, I was obsessed with Studio Two at Larrabee. I mean, obsessed. That, that was, I always said, that's going to be my room. I'm going to fucking retire in that room. And, uh, and I'll never forget that. And it's funny because Tricky and I always talk about that night. And, uh, you know, a few years later, I end up back at Larrabee. But KD had that room. So I'm like, man, I need that room. I want to I wanna be in that room. So I had one, <laughs> which was his amazing room, too. But uh, And then Kevin was building this room, Studio 3. And at the time, it was surround. You know, it was like people were doing surround mixes, 5-1 mixes. Yeah. KD wanted to take over Studio 3, and it was the new room. I'm like, listen, if anyone's getting the new room, it's me. Uh, but I knew that KD wanted Studio 3, so I kind of started, like, not necessarily manipulating it, but I was like, oh, no, no, Studio 3 is going to be my room. And it became this whole, whole like, no, 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 KD has seniority here, so therefore he gets the new room. I'm like, excellent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got Studio 2. Wow. But, yeah. Painting this fence sure is fun, kids. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I told Kale, I'm like, look, just redo the patio for me. And sure, fine, I'll move to Studio 2. Shit, okay. <laughs> it worked out. It worked out. I haven't. 20, 20 years that. later. 23 years later, maybe. Yeah. Fucking hell, man. Well, look, we, we this is great, but we got to go back and talk about just a few of these records, too, because yeah. there are a few. And I know 
it's not the same like when you talk to the people who are recording obviously it's a lot more the thing but some of these records you're super involved with in really important records so i'd love to just hear anything there's to say like the alicia keys record yeah the songs oh in a God. minor i mean oh my gosh come on can i tell you the best story like yes what i alicia and the the very first time i met her she she must have been gosh 17 maybe 17, 18, gosh, she was so young. So I go to New York. I had, uh, I was working with Boys to Men, uh, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Co- Cozier, uh, Olivia. Okay, so J Records, right? Clive gets uh, his imprint on J Records, and Olivia and Alicia were the two of the first artists that they signed. So I went and mixed some Olivia stuff, and then this girl named Alicia Key, right? So I'm doing, I'm working on this one song. I believe it was Jane Doe. Uh, Brian McKnight, I think, produced it. So, anyways, I'm, I'm mixing the song, and very early in the day, uh, you know, our auto tune is this H3000. I don't remember. We tune, detune, punch, detune, yeah. punch. We had to go through the whole song and fix, and I just became really fast at it. It would take me maybe 10, 15 minutes to tune the whole song, right? And then I, when I heard it, I was like, oh, there's some pitchy notes. Let me just fix them real quick. Boom, 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 boom. And, you know, you would copy the track so you have a map, uh, safety of it and all that. So I had my, quote, tune vocal. And that was earlier, early in the day, maybe around noon when I first got in. Mix of, you know, the whole song. It was a beautiful, beautiful song. She comes in around 9, 10 um, with Carrie, Carrie Crucial, the producer. I play in the song. This is the first time I met Alicia. And she listens to it and goes, wow, man, this is great. I love the mix. It's so good. I, you know, I wouldn't change a thing, which is so rare, right, to, like, have someone just not have a single comment. And maybe she was just being nice because it was the first time we met. And uh, But she was, uh, but then she's like, you know, let me listen to it again because there is one thing that I just don't know what it is. But uh, play it one more time. Played it again. Like, again, the mix is great, but there's something with my vocal, you know, there's, so I'm like, okay, maybe, you know, and I'm looking at the desk, right? And I'm like, oh, I got some, maybe some reverb, some maybe a, a slap delay and maybe a slight harmonize. Let me take them off. No, no, put it back on. Okay, that no, that's fine. I don't, gosh, I, I don't know. It was maybe a treatment. Maybe it's an EQ. Maybe it's this, this. And I'm trying to get it out of her. And she's like, no, it's like, so I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Hang on. Uh when I first came in, oh, let me patch around. I, I you know, I fixed a couple of tuning uh, <laughs> notes, you know, but I have forgotten. I, not that I was trying to, you know. Yeah, it's just something you did on every mix, really. Every mix, yeah. So then I play her that, and she goes, boom, that's it. That's 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 what I want. And this is where the, the one of those moments that I, I'll never forget, this 17-year-old kid telling me this. She goes, she goes, well, Manny, so check it out. So. I didn't go to school. I'm not an expert at uh, speaking English, and like I'm not an English ma- major, and like so. What I want to do is uh, I want my fans to connect with me or for who I am. So if there is a, a pitch, pitchy note here and there, then that's to me saying that I'm not perfect, and that is why the record is special to me. Fucked me up <laughs> to wow. this day. I'm like, so the pursuit of perfection, what does that mean to a young mixer was fixing? You know, where we always joke, we're fixers, not mixers. And to me, from that point on, it changed my entire, entire mixing career on the pursuit of what perfection is. Here's like what I think was off, I'm fixing. But yeah, she's telling me that that is what the emotion is supposed to be about. And as a young mixer, Man, it changed my life till this day. I uh, I take that approach on. There's no such thing as perfection. It's about emotion. And this 17 year old kid is teaching me this, you know. Right. And that's the first time I met her. And from that point on, we we worked on gosh five six albums, you know, tour the world, not the world, but a lot of places with her. And I was you know became kind of her dude at the time. So yeah, that's a it's a pretty. I mean, look, it's one thing to say, like, oh, you tune my vocal, I don't want it tuned. But to that's a pretty deep reason to not tune it. So deep. I mean, so deep. Uh, I couldn't, uh, 
to the, I remember it like it was yesterday. And I, recently we spoke about that night and she's like, yeah, she could obviously wouldn't remember. There's so many stories that I have from her that I'd learned from, from her. But this was the most powerful one at the time where I thought I was in the pursuit of perfection. And then for me, at that, 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 that moment, I started changing the style of mixing, you know, uh, to, to be more, more authentic than, than, quote, perfect. And, um, and yeah, it just changed my whole approach. Uh, wow. Just for one session. I mean, I got <laughs> goosebumps you telling me the story. So I can only imagine what it was like in the room. I mean, that it's huge. Yeah, man. Uh, it's like, and it, there's so many of those moments, too, like you said. Um, but that was the Alicia one of many aha moments. Man. Yeah. Well, you got any others from that kind of era? Because, I mean, I could just start listing credits, but it's it's kind of like everybody anyone has ever heard of is is in your list and like we got a couple years to go before we get to someone else i definitely want to talk about but um i mean it was a santana record in there too it was santana with greg alexander and rick knowles producing yeah all right and uh, michelle branch yep little bit of this a little bit of that damn i sang it oh shit. nice uh, <laughs> let me <laughs> auto tune my ass. Uh, so we uh, that was a crazy record because it had been mixed already. And if you know Greg Alexander and Rick Knowles, those guys very uh, uh, very charismatic individuals. Uh, yes. So uh, man, that was the first time that I can remember Clive and The Office. I remember Rainy Hancock even emailing me like oh my gosh you like this 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 and that and it was such a you know interesting mix because when we greg was in london and he was very involved but then the label didn't want him to be really involved you know <laughs> and then rick was involved but the label didn't want him involved so i was kind of like in the middle of this you know very very uh, just oh man just very interesting session i remember being you know, Clive saying, don't let him in the room, don't do this. And I, look, I can only imagine that they made a mix and that Clive may not, you know, not like. So they kind of wanted to do your own thing, you know. And I did, and I just went for it. And, you know, a couple comments here from Rick and Greg. and But uh, it was it was like the Santana moment that, you know, growing up as a Latino in L.A., I mean, Santana was maybe one of the closest ones that you can, kind of relate to because it wasn't spanish but it was english and it was kind of yes yeah. yeah julio good. iglesias and then him yeah there was not a lot so for me to be even like pulling up his you know the faders with him playing a solo was like i mean psh, yeah. <laughs> so uh but it became you know then it became a huge hit after that and uh michelle i mean i mean that's that's one of the, my favorite songs. And the one thing I remember people calling me saying, hey, man, and I remember this being a maybe a transition uh, from doing big, uh, you know, booty shaking music, like low end, bigger than anything else to almost like a thin mix. And, if, and I remember that uh, not having a lot of punch to it. You know, I remember being almost... But I feel like that was the transition for me going from 808s and big kicks and big low end and anything else kind of was secondary. It's almost the opposite. It was the low end wasn't as important uh, as the vibe and the groove and all that. And as a, again, as a young mixer discovering things about yourself, like my natural self would have been like adding a ton of low end because that's what I'm used to. That's how I've been mixing records. But uh Having the, uh, man, just the, uh, I don't know what the word is, but having, you know, being humble enough to trying something that you know you're not used to and being in a very vulnerable, like, well, what, what I would do because I just mix Mary or whatever, whoever the art, you know, I would do this to this. And they're calling me because, because they probably want this, this and that, you know, that would have been the most obvious thing to do. But I remember very clearly not doing that. Like, don't, no, no, don't reach for that kick. Oh, no, no, don't, 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 leave the bass alone. Don't put some 80 hertz or 40 hertz on it. And how come? Like, what made you decide to do that? Was that a conversation you'd had or? Not a conversation at all, actually. It was just about, you know, the level that Clive wanted it, the, the impact, the, uh, the emotion, the, uh, 
the horns. It was more about something completely different than what I was used to. And, and I honestly, it was just very, maybe just natural, you know, to, to, uh, for the song to be this way, as opposed to me giving it a sound, you know? And I think that was early, you know, cause I never just wanted to do one genre. I wanted to like cross genres just cause I love music and I never wanted to be the hip hop guy or the rock guy or this guy, or, you know, we all get pigeonholed unfairly because I feel like we can do more than just one genre, all of us. So at the time, if you remember, it was like, you wouldn't cross genres as easily. Um, yeah. And I always wanted to do that. I always very conscious to be able to do that. But subconsciously, it was coming out almost not natural, but uh, naturally, but it was forgetting what I learned from hip hop and R&B and maybe applying it to now what pop was beginning to be pop and, you know, and sell records. So uh, it was a different approach. It was a very, very different approach. And even to this day, I listen to that mix and it has nothing to do with low end, but the impact of the song itself, you know? So I think for, to learn about what makes you feel a certain way, how you tap your foot, your shoulder and all that, I feel like that's more powerful than the actual sonics. And that's why, you know, going from the Alicia story to this, to, I mean, there's another hundred of those stories that kind of made me think a different way than I think a lot of us were thinking at the time. Um, I, I always joke like, man, I want to, you know, I want to mix from Buster Rhymes to Leon Rhymes, you know, <laughs> so I wanted to, uh, I wanted to mix it all. I didn't want to, again, be pigeonholed to uh, just, you know, doing one thing. And, uh, and I remember going to my manager thinking, look, I want to do this record. It's like, well, they don't have the budget for you. You know, you're going to lose money by working on that. I'm like, I don't care, but I want to. I want to. I want to do that. And and there was a project, uh, uh, Citizen Cope, the Clarence Greenwood recordings. Where, I mean, we didn't lose money, but it was one of those where the budget wasn't as big as some of the other budgets that I was working on. And of course, my manager, the the protector that he <laughs> should be, was like, "No, nah, man, we got so many other projects that will pay X amount." And but I found a connection, and he was kind of like an alternative, you know, I, I, I always say he was post Malone before post Malone. Uh, very, very, uh, and we started doing records like that. Like, you know, uh, there's a song called Pablo Picasso. And I mean, that just kind of changed my life and changed the way I mix records as well. And, uh, and it was kind of getting away from like that stereotype that Manny only does R and B, you know, if you want an R B mix, there's these three guys go to one of the three. Right. And I feel like that's the first time when someone called me and it's like, oh, that's some live guitar stuff and live drums. And people were not used to that. And I'm thinking, well, shit, I'm a, I am started as a live drum, as a drummer. So yeah. I, well, that was kind of like my natural. And I started going back to last couple of weeks ago where I learned from Jimbo, just based on basic mic techniques. on EQ. And that's how I learned how to EQ. So for me, doing this live you know sound was very very organic and natural for me to work on and, and at the time i almost preferred it you know so then i started mixing a ton of things that had live instrumentation which i felt very comfortable doing so i, I know it sounds weird but it's at the time you know it was very hard to kind of cross those you know people yeah. like oh you don't do with live drums or vice versa uh, now, now it's a genreless world, so it's very common, uh, more common, but not not back in whatever ninety eight, ninety nine. No, I'm no, playing. not at all, not at all. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive, you know, you to be able to stop yourself. Like it, you didn't give them the first mix, and they said, "Oh, hold on a second, we don't really want that thing." You're like, "Oh, right, okay, you get it." But to get it while you're mixing is pretty impressive. You know, being conscious of, you know, of what that is that is in front of you, you know, and, and also what uh, to me is like being a fan of music, too. You know, like I grew up in neighborhoods where my my the, the, the kids I was hanging out with, we all listen to hip hop. That's all we listen to. But then at Hamilton, we play jazz and everything with live instrumentation, jam bands. We have like fucking rock guitar. So I grew up with this very rock playing aggressive you know sometimes even not metal but very distorted guitars but then i would go to the kids in my neighborhood and we'd listen to 
only hip hop. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but it was uh, I, I'm, I, you know, I was happy to be a part of maybe understanding uh, both. Uh, I don't want to say cultures, but genres, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, because I think I think very early on, you got the fact that there can be angry rock and angry hip-hop, and they make you feel the same way. Yeah. It's not different. You know, a good punk track and an aggressive hip-hop track, it's the same thing in terms of what you feel while you're listening to it. And that's, again, there's a lot to that. And to be able to unpack that just on the fly is pretty badass. You know, but it's just becoming a, a, music, a fan too. Like that, I learned more about being a fan. You know, uh, I remember uh, same so right around the same Alicia time where uh, Marilyn Manson was, you know, coming out with, you know, his demonic sort of like facade, right? And I remember having the TV on. And MTV was playing like all like Marilyn Manson's videos, and people were getting freaked out by him because he was a devil worshiper and all that. And, I remember clients would say, turn it off, turn it off, right? And then a f- couple years later, Beautiful People comes out, and, and you're like, what the fuck? That's like the greatest sound I've heard. And I listened to that record so many times and analyzed why and how, and just it sounded so amazing, right? So, um, so I started to now realize that if you hate something, right, that's a very strong emotion. It's as, yeah. as, as loving something, right? So I always say that if you find yourself hating something, you should take a deep breath and analyze why you hate it because it obviously triggered an emotion that you should be aware of. Uh, and you can utilize that while, you, while you're being creative. Like if you hate something, that means someone got to you. <laughs> you yeah, yeah, yeah. Being well, indifferent is bad, but hating yeah. it is not. Yeah. So I always say anytime you think you're hating something, take a deep breath and and try to analyze why why you hate it. Right, right. And then again, why you like it. Because when Beautiful People came out, it retained all of the theatrics and all of that, but it's the Nine Inch Nails production, but it's glam. Yep, 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 exactly. exactly. You know. Uh, and, you know, you learn so much from those moments, you know, and I, and I believe that we continue to, like, learn from those moments, even in music today. You know, yeah. It doesn't ago and it's something that we are you know i continue to learn every day yeah well look man I, i'm aware of the time here so we're going to skip over the fact that you did actually mix a leanne rhymes record right about the same time <laughs> yeah. because yeah. because just after that is the first time you worked with kanye so let's let's talk about kanye because that's been in a very very long relationship with That's a guy good. who doesn't seem like someone people would have long relationships with. So, yeah. and you're there pretty much from the beginning. I was there from the, from day one. Yeah. So I met him through Mike Karen. He, uh, he was producing, um, uh, not slum village. Uh, I'm going to, anyways, it, there was a, there was a group, uh, out of Mississippi, a bunch of guys. And anyways, we were, he uh, he was producing. He comes into the studio uh, right after the blueprint, um, and he was really quiet, but super talented, um, up and coming producer. There were many of those at the time, right? But there, he just had something. So we hit it off. Then he called me again and again on stuff that he was producing. And then one day he goes, "Look, I'm working on my own album." I'm like, "All right, here we go." <laughs> and he starts like rapping, like acapella, and I'm like. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, this guy's a storyteller. I mean, he's like a slick Rick of today. Uh, he's very visual. I can visualize what he's saying. It's, it, it, and I got I to gotta tell you, man, from that point on, I remember being like almost like a protector, like my little brother. Because people, you know, at the time, again, he was not wearing clothes that other people were wearing, like, you know, but the oversized jerseys and this, he, he was wearing, you know, Slightly, you know, definitely different. He was quote a backpack producer, definitely different than what was going at the time uh, on the beats he was trying to sell. So there were many cases, many, many times where people would walk in and be so disrespectful to him, like, man, sh- shut the hell up, just play me some beats, you know? No, 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 you gotta hear this. And, and he was like a little kid, like you know that kid that you know gets sent to the, the bedroom, his bedroom, you know, like just like, you know, because <laughs> people didn't want to listen to him as a rapper. But there was something really special about him, you know, 
uh, and from that point on, we were we the whole most of the first album, College Dropout, we actually worked on it at Larrabee under other people's budget because he <laughs> didn't have a budget. So we would literally work on his album, and then at six, seven, I would throw faders up because that you know the client was coming. <laughs> And it was like the quickest fucking mix ever. And I literally would do a two hour mix with him just watching me. I'm like, go, go, go. They're going to be here. They're going to be here. <laughs> Boom. They would walk in and we play the mix. And they're like, yeah. And he was a great seller too. Like, even if the mix wasn't there, he's like, yeah, check this out. And boom. And they would leave an hour later. <laughs> and then we go back to this album. So we did that album, like most of it on other people's budget. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'll never forget this. Um, I was in Atlanta and uh, I was talking to G and he, uh, man, I was so excited about Ye's album and he calls and said that, you know, the label, the label was going to drop him. And I was like, oh, what a bummer. Cause he didn't really fit again what Rock, Rockefeller was doing at the time. So I was so disappointed, right? I was like, oh man, I really, really like what we were doing with him and his stuff and his music and him and all. And then he got into an accident like a week later when I came back to L.A. He left the studio and, you know, he almost, you know, lost his life. As a matter of fact, I just read something that that happened 20 years ago, a couple of days ago or something wow. crazy. So he almost died. And uh, a week later, we're in my studio here. Unlike, you know, they say that he tracked it at record plant, but he was tracking it everywhere. But we finished most of it in Studio 2 where he wrapped through a wire. His wire, his mouth was wired shut and he literally did the whole fucking verse, you know? <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he, I'll never forget when he ordered lunch. Uh, there's not a lot you can eat. <laughs> he ordered some chili and we put it through a blender and he was eating it through a straw. Which was so wild. I don't know why I remember that, but, but that's, a. Uh, you know, he released through the wire and that was it, man. It never, I've never seen any trajectory from any artist quite like that. It just kind of went from here and, and it hasn't, you know, stopped. And then from that point on, we developed this pretty cool relationship, you know, um, from, uh, you know, I would drop him off every night because obviously he wasn't driving. Uh, and we talk about, you know, just being cocky or being confident and you could tell already at a very young age, he was kind of building this alter ego in his, in his head on what, you know, he building that character. So, so he was a, you know, a extremely, extremely smart. Um, and, uh, yeah, it became, you know, one of those great relationships over the years. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've worked on pretty much everything he's done, right? Most of it. Yeah. Yeah. Most of it. So, sometimes, you know, there's stuff that I didn't for whatever reason, but, I would say most of it. So, I mean, and this is only because I'm slightly ignorant. So the persona <laughs> that he built, I mean, and obviously that persona is very, very well known. Yeah. But has it sort of taken over or is is he still the same dude when you get in a room with him and you're just working? You know, I think, I think no matter who you are, it's got to change you. You know, it's got to change, you know, your perception of life. I mean, we always see what... You know, some of these big personalities, um, you know, it's impossible to stay the same, right? So uh, I think he has changed. I mean, to me, you know, listen, I never mix politics and music ever, ever. But I think for the first time I did because, you know, uh, in certain administration that, that were putting kids in cages trying to cross the border, you know, hey, I just told you about my story. That could have been me. So yeah can support that ideology um, and anyone that supports that I have a problem with it because you know there's ways you can handle it without being you know in you know a very more humane way of doing it than, than is there a problem absolutely but someone that supports that uh, I just don't necessarily I don't want to fuck with you know and uh, and I never crossed that you know I never drawn that line because I don't think it should until it hits home. So uh, when he came, when he did come out and start supporting someone like Trump, whether it's all you know theatrics, whether you support him because you're trying to, he's a great marketing, he's a marketing genius. That's what he is, 
or or you do support that ideology. So either way, either either one is not cool with me. So I think that since then, I don't know if I would be the right person to work on his music because I don't think I would. Right. I, would, I wouldn't put my heart and soul into it for those reasons. So and again, this is the first time I've ever done that. You know. Uh, uh, so I think that over the years, whether you become that person or not, you know, then at yeah, some point, yeah. you, it's part of you. Yeah, and, and for me, it's like, look, at some point, you gotta stand up for what you believe in. Yeah, look, and and until recently, the choices weren't that extreme in the yeah. mainstream. The extreme exactly. was on the outsides, but yeah. now all you've got is that, so it, it you're confronted with it more. Exactly. So I think that could be one, you know, a main reason why I just I, I wouldn't be the right guy for the job. But right. Anyway. All right. Look, we're gonna. It's got a 20 to 9 already. Right, let me ask you about a couple more things, because there's a record you did in 2004 for Khaled, the Algerian guy. And people, everyone's going to think it's DJ, right? But he's like he's like the fucking superstar of the Rai music in, in Algeria. Yeah, man. So how did that one come up, like, in the middle of you just being on fire? I mean, you're a supernova at this point, basically. <laughs> Man, I can't believe you brought him up. Shit, that was incredible. I, I, you know, um, I think I forget the label, um, but it must have been something that I had done that someone heard, or maybe the label heard and thought it was a good idea for me to, you know, mix it. Or, but I remember at the time he was like, "Fuck, man!" It was one of my favorite things that I worked on, and again, maybe because it was so different from what I was working on at the time. Uh, and there's a lot of projects that I think back and feel like they kind of change your perception of what you like, you know, because <laughs> you feel like, oh, this is what I'm I love mixing right now. And I can mix, you know, 100 more records like this. Uh, but, you know, there's another one, Kanan, that's uh, also uh, he's a uh, Somalian. And I, I remember a lot of African artists throughout you know, my career that you know, that I've worked on and it, it's, just, you know, it's just refreshing for me. It's, it was so refreshing to work on something that I maybe haven't heard quite like it, you know, and I, I didn't know he, thankfully I didn't know he was such a big star, you know, like uh, that it just kind of, it was fun. Yeah. You know? So funny that you bring him up. Yeah. But I think it's, it's really interesting because it goes back to the Santana thing in a way, like you're never trying to impose your will. You're never like, Hey man, this is the thing I do. You're always doing what you feel is right for the music. Yeah. Yeah. I always say it, you know, some people want sounds, right. And I always, you know, I'm very mindful of not having a sound, you know, because it's not about, it's not about me. It's not about us. We're just lucky enough to put, give our opinions on something. I mean, that's, that to me is so, it's such an honor to for someone to ask for my opinion and actually care, you know. And how we do our how we give them our opinion is based on what we send back, right? Uh, sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't. Sometimes we work on it together, but it's really just asking for your professional opinion. So, yeah, I'm always honored that people would ask for an opinion that they they care what I have to say, and what they do is is not about me. It's not about what I can give them is what I, how I can contribute to what their vision ultimately is, and uh, I feel like that mentality has gotten me out of trouble many times, you know. Right, but you manage to catch yourself before you ever get in trouble, whereas I think a lot of people might sort of go down the the road and then recover, and like, oh right, yeah, yeah okay, from these comments, I get I got to do something different, and then sort of rediscover it. But that you do that on the fly by yourself is pretty yeah. impressive. You know, it's 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 crazy because uh, um, I think people tend to overcomplicate things, you know, and I think that this business is all about, I mean, look, you have to have, you have to think you're the best. You just have to. You got to think that you're the best producer, engineer, mixer, artist in the world. You have to, but you don't have to verbalize it, right? Uh, but you also got to be humble enough to be able to learn from other people that you look up to from maybe even some younger producer, artist, engineer mixer and that's a very very tough um it, 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 it could get the vision could get become very blurry because you don't know what to hang on to yeah because you still gotta have that confidence right and not the cockiness but the confidence but you still got to be humble enough to learn like we just went and talked about the, the pro tools shift right where people were too not humble enough actually they were just hey this is the way i make records i made 
a gazillion dollars making records like this. Go fuck yourself. I'm not going to change it. Right. Well, that, that's not being humble about something. So therefore, you're. I mean, nobody knows who you are now because you weren't humble enough to embrace that. So I think that's a co the combination of both is really tricky. And so, you know, and I think we all have to be aware of that to, to hopefully do a, do a good job. Well, and I think like it would have been really easy for you to come out of that Alicia Keys session saying like, well, I guess she just doesn't want her vocal tune, but whatever. And like not have gotten this absolute landmine blown up in your face about what you had to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, it's just going like, going back to being a student of the game, right? I mean, we all got to stay humble and learn. I mean, you know, Babyface gave me the best explanation of what the ego is like. You know, we were so crazy. We were doing the stones. That was like my first week being his engineer. We were doing the stones. And he had just come off the uh, Change the World, uh, Eric Clapton, remember? Grammys and all that. Yeah. So, Stones were like, oh, we want the baby face sound. So I just so happened to be there. And Ed, you know, obviously he's recording it. I'm just a fly in the wall. And and they have, you know, all the stones are there and baby face playing the roads. It was incredible, incredible. I wish I had a freaking, you know, a camera or, you know, I wish I had evidence of that. So, um, you know, baby, you know, we got in the car after the, this one session with the stones. We were at Ocean Way, going back to Brandon's Way. So we, uh, you know, the way he described it, and I always say this now, it's like, imagine having a sheet, a, a sheet right in front of you, but the thread count is, you know, it's, you can see through it. You can kind of see shapes, but you can't really see through it, I guess. You can't, def all the, defi you can't see the defined, you know, like say if someone's standing in front of you, you can't see their eyes or mouth, but you see the shape, right? So he described that as being the ego, where you can actually kind of see, but not clearly, right? He goes, the moment you remove that sheet, now you can see clearly. And he goes, and that's your ego. And when you have that sheet, you're going to be, there's going to be people that are going to go right past you because you're just focused on this image. When the sheet is removed, you can see everything around you. You can see who's coming up behind you, who's in front of you. And now you're aware of, of everything around you. And that's, to me, that was like the best explanation of what the ego really is. And wow move that sheet then you're you know then then you can see clearly and you can make better choices better decisions you know it's amazing and coming from someone who you know of all the people in the music business who could get away with having an ego those guys could have and they <laughs> they did exactly. yeah someone like baby face cause that's amazing I, man look we're gonna have to get to the q a all right so here's what we're gonna do i'm gonna mention the fact that in 2005 in terms of when they came out you mixed 55 albums <laughs> really yeah i counted those should we just I, I don't even know what to fucking say about that i didn't even write down any artists names it's just like it was too many it was 55 but what we're gonna do we're gonna do a little q a get you out of here this is next is gonna be part three of four we're not gonna finish this in one more but yeah. we're gonna start off with john mayer because i think that's a big thing as well yeah. right yeah that was a big yeah. All right. All right. So that that's where we're going to start next time. But let's get Mark in here, get you some questions, because technically you only got like 10 minutes, but we'll go yeah. until you say no more. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. All right. This is it's amazing. I actually am rested after these. It's not like <laughs> tell Brower, man, we could have done that in five parts. <laughs> um, this is it, the fact that anybody is listening is amazing. Man, they are. And it it's amazing. It really, really is. The, and it's it's always like this where there's stuff that just I mean, I get my mind blown every single time I interview anybody and you've had some stuff that's just like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, you know, you. so even if no one's watching just for me, this is well worth it. But believe me, there are thousands of people watching, which is great because it should Listen, be going back to those moments, too. It's like, oh, because I haven't really, you know, I still kind of had the blinders on, you know, we never really get to talk about stuff like this so it's it's really unique for me to go back to those moments and trying to relive and what my perception of it was and i'm sure if that person was sitting here their perception could be completely different right completely different. yeah so yeah yeah absolutely so, absolutely i mean your perception is your reality though and if something's a big deal it's a big deal yeah hey there was a study uh, that just came out that scientists believe that 50 percent they're 50% sure that this 
could all be a simulation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, because what would be the difference? Making That's the you thing. Up right now. I'm making you up in my head right now. It's giving me some. That's compliment. cool, man. Could you give me some more hair on top, though? <laughs> <laughs> Help me I out. That. Yeah, I don't know. That could be tough. <laughs> You're already there, so. <laughs> The next life. Oh, you come know? on. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, this is great. So yeah, I'm here for anybody that wants awesome. to Awesome. Well, yeah, I'll email and we'll, we'll set up part three for as soon as you can do it. So yeah. excellent. All right, Mark, what do you got? Awesome. All right. A lot of questions. Mark, you can <laughs> so amazing. Fuck. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> you exfoliate? What? exfoliate do i exfoliate i don't i don't should i look into this <laughs> you know what i'm going to youtube for okay uh so for anybody watching on youtube or facebook we are taking questions over in crowdcast the link is in the description if you want to go over there and submit a question we start with the most upvoted question on crowdcast and our most upvoted question today is from oh3 who has a burning question i should probably get it checked out where do you leave the overall mix level before you actually send it to master and how much headroom should I be leaving for the master? So I feel like nowadays we're kind of pre mastering our mixes anyway. Um, I mean, I, I think that for me, that's, that could be episode 20 cause we can spend three hours talking about gain structure and all that. But for me is look, there's two ways. The, 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 you know, I try to, yeah, I try to be as hot as possible, you know, whatever loves that is. I'm very aware of my loves, but if I feel like I'm on the brink of destruction, I try, I send two versions to the client. Actually, I say, this is like my hyped pre-master version. And this is the unhype one, uh, which I think obviously I would prefer the unhype nine out of 10 times, but at least it gives the client the, uh, the ability to choose. So, I do, you know, I smack the desk. My meters on the desk don't move. Um, so I like the sound of that saturation off the desk. Um, and then if it becomes, you know, if it's my, you know, minus whatever, 10, 8 loves, which is, I mean, I've seen some minus 6 <laughs> that are crazy. But, you know, I try Welcome to... Welcome to uh, my world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get them too, you know. I try not to, um, you know, I try to... I try to, my, my approach is to be as loud as possible without, you know, without breaking it up uh, and uh, how, and how we add dynamics to that. So, you know, if, if you're like at your loudest section in the mix, maybe I'll start with that and then kind of work my way backwards so we can add dynamics to that loudest section. So, so you don't have, you don't get this, you know, you're not agitated by the time you, you're done with the mix or the song, you, you know, the, what we do is, how, how can we make you hit repeat on that song? That's our job. Mm -hmm. Like, how can we make, how, how, what, what can we do to, for you to hit repeat? Right. Uh, and again, there's maybe a hundred different ways to achieve that. One is, you know, I always say when we choke the mix, right. I mean, there's a reason why people want to go to the next song. They may not even know what that is. So our mm -hmm. job to, in today's world, uh, is how do we how do we navigate through the loudness and still give it some life? Yeah, know? yeah, and I think I think there is a misconception that a certain number, it, like well now you can't have any life in the mix, and that's not true, man. There are mixes that are so loud and have so much impact yeah. and excitement, and it, yeah, the numbers are weird. And I also want to ask you because you're sitting in your your Atmos room. I mean, with Atmos, you've got to be at minus eighteen gotta be yep. and it's kind of crazy it's really really interesting because yeah. you're a b and with mixes you've just turned down 11 db exactly i gotta turn down my mix my stereo mix about that much about 11 db 10 11 and kind of a b it and be like oh shit i mean so you learn so much about energy on how you smack certain things and and how when you unglue it now you're like man it's like such a different way of thinking and world and it's kind of a, it's exciting but it's like relearning how to mix yeah and luffs too i mean look you want to get away with a louder mix just do a fucking breakdown in the middle right <laughs> it'll go down <laughs> like your choruses can still be at like minus two yeah. and it'll you know say it's at minus 30 right. exactly <laughs> 
you know, it's a combination of technology and, 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 you know, and how we, how we perceive that, like you said, sections, right. And how frequencies, we just talked about 1k being there, you know, like 10k being like happy. And how do we, how can we manipulate some of those frequencies based on the sound, the source, and how can we mind fuck the listener into thinking that they, they are taking a maybe a mental break, whether it's those two short two seconds or eight bars or whatever that is. And I think that's a that's a it's definitely in our form today that wasn't there, you know, 20 years ago. And when you're talking about having a hyped and an unhyped, is it as simple as a limiter or are you drop in level going into the mix bus or where yeah. is your difference? Going, going into the processing, this, you know, all the, you know, some of the. You know, as you know, if someone has an Ozone 9 on their rough mix, we have to get that. You have like, to compete. We, yeah, well, we have to at least... It would be the equivalent to playing a guitar through a Wawa and having the direct signal and me getting the direct signal without the Wawa. I would be like, well, shit, just print the Wawa because that's, that's like part of the sound. You know, that's part of your production. And we talked about this last time where, yeah. you know, don't send your ozone nine just because you it's ip to your whatever the whoever did the rough i got news for you you're gonna look like an idiot because you know the artist is gonna be like no just send it jesus christ you know it's just a plug-in so uh so we have to start like that we have to start with that ozone nine and now we can start building from that and taking you know shaving it and coloring it from there but we gotta have that so for me it's like if i have a signal going in i tend to lower that and that would be my unheight mix which now gives you a little bit more headroom right right and uh, awesome. but, it, but but you but the glue is not there you know the glue changes. no it, it's the, i think you know it's gotten and for good reason in a lot of cases especially my mixes like level has gotten a bad name like you have to have dynamic range and not be too loud but it's why some of this stuff is exciting. I, my example is always put on a Skrillex record and that's as close to a square wave as you're ever going to get. And it's so exciting. It's insane. Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of the producers are just, you know, are going to have to adapt, like the new generation, how they adapt to this new world that we live in. Yeah. It loves and, you know, but it's always been like that. All right, Mark, what do you got? Awesome. All right, next one is from Jan, and their question is, what's your philosophy on referencing your mix against other mixes? What do you listen for, and do you do it at all? I don't do it at all. Um, oh, man, I, I haven't. You know, sometimes a client will say, hey, listen to this song, and I sometimes I don't listen to it just because my perception of that song is probably better than what I think the actual song is. <laughs> Uh, you know, so I try to, um, yeah, I, I just haven't done that. I know maybe, uh, uh, other mixers will listen to whatever. I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. I, I just don't reference other mixers or other mixes that I've done in the past too. You know, I just kind of go for maybe more of the, the raw energy that's in front of me. Cause again, the mind, uh, you know, the mind manipulation that happens in every mix, is just, you know, I mean, I think we can all relate to that and how you look, sometimes you may have a bad day in your personal life and that can kind of, you know, it's, you know, it spills over to your mix that day, you know, and you could have a really good day, but the song is sad and you can all of a sudden the ballad sounds like a happy ballad, you know? So it's like being aware of what that emotion that this, the song should have and what your mental state it's really, really important. And I think that people that do it over and over and over again, some people do it on a conscious level and others do it maybe subconsciously where you kind of, it's a, it's, a, it's a muscle that we've trained to kind of separate ourselves. I always say when that door closes, I mean, this is, this is a tonic temple. I should be, whatever happened outside of these, this room, my mind, I have to hit that switch and reset it in a way, you know, so that you can give that song the best possible chance uh so so for me it's like i try not to listen to other things be because they will influence me a certain way you know and i'm not saying you shouldn't i'm just saying for me personally i just want to grab that emotion yeah. that the raw emotion you know and see what happens with that you know? i think we're we're very similar in that way like i just get confused but there are some people who've got playlists like i know uh, jjp and greg wells both have playlists that they'll listen to while they're working 
But for me, like what's confusing about it is, let's say you've got a mix that you say, well, okay, this is the one where I love the low end on this mix. But if the difference in level between the bass and the vocal is different than on your mix, like how do you even compare it? Like what are you listening to? Which level do you put the same? And yeah, it, it's it just impossible. Becomes- yeah, it just becomes really confusing, and and again, you have to be really careful with that because now now a, a confused mixer is like the worst mixer ever, you know. <laughs> Who's like, got two thumbs? <laughs> Who's confused? This guy. This guy right here. <laughs> I highly doubt that. Oh, so. it's true. <laughs> okay, here's a a really good question from Rez. Um, do you and Andrew? pay any attention to the triad of health in relation to studio work? Uh, so eating, exercise, and sleep. Do you have any systems to split your sessions to make sure you eat regularly, stretch, et cetera? Yeah, man, you have to. I think you, you know, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So, you know, getting your mind right. Uh, you know, even if you just sit, I try to sit alone for 10 minutes throughout the day. Maybe sometimes I do 20 minutes, but just sitting alone, just turning, you know, just not listening to music and just, you know, meditating, I guess. For me, meditation is not a, a mantra, but maybe just listening to your own thoughts, you know. And, uh, to me, that's more powerful because your mind, you, you'll you see what state of mind you're in because sometimes your mind will just go fucking a million miles an hour. You close your eyes, you're almost like dizzy just from your mind going so fast. And that I know myself that, that I know my mind is very stimulated today. So maybe I maybe I'll slow it down and then I'll just let my thoughts just kind of take me on a journey in a way. It could be about food, could be about mixes, could be about my card, the weather, whatever it is. Just let your for me, I let my mind kind of take me on that journey. And then I then 10 minutes, 20 minutes later, I open my eyes and and I reapproach what I was approaching in a slightly different way. You know, I try to do boxing a, f- a few times a, a week, and that just to fucking hit something really hard. And my trainer <laughs> that isn't an assistant. <laughs> uh, it's legal. <laughs> I don't. I won't. Yeah, that's legal. <laughs> so I think uh, you know, I used to take uh, just walks uh, um, and listen to uh, just motivational things. You know, I I always think you should spend 20 maybe 10 15 20 minutes a day learning something that something new you know and uh and i try to do that uh you know i started a restaurant and i've been really really involved in that so for me my meditation is kind of listening to podcasts from other restaurant tours on their journey and to me that's learning a learning something new so that you know that you can just become a better mixer you know because i think that being away from the studio makes everyone better and appreciate it more. And, you know, I know we'll talk about verse next, next time, but to me, that's given me so much more life as a mixer. Cause now I, I, you go back to the thing you love the most and you, you see a whole different, you know, a whole different career, not career, a whole different sector and, and food and beverage that is challenging. And, and you come, come back here and you're like, man, whoa, I'm so, thankful to be in the studio right now and not doing some big dishes or food or and it's given me this new sort of life and appreciation even almost 30 years later like almost like a little kid the same feeling i had when i was 19 you know? uh, so yeah so your mind has to be right your body has to be right um, and if it's not then you're gonna crash i mean you're just gonna crash yeah, I, I'm the same. If if it wasn't for my wife, I would not eat properly. That's for damn sure. But <laughs> like five or six years ago, we started doing yoga. And that's been really helpful, both physically, because I've had a bad back forever. And that's helped a lot. But also mentally, just to say, even if it weren't yoga, but to say, like, I know I've got a ton of work to do, but it's Monday, it's 10am, I got an hour and a half class, and I got to do it. And mm-hmm. it, that's been really, really good. And I think having other interests is important, too. Because First of all, it's taking a break. But second of all, anybody who's good at anything has something to teach you about the thing that you're doing. It doesn't matter what those two things are. Mm -hmm. They could seem completely unrelated, but everything is related. It's Mm -hmm. all about how you approach things, how you get to the end of something, how you make people happy, what people think about your work, what you think about your work. It's always the same. Mm -hmm. Amen. Awesome. 
so fun listening to you guys talk about this because I'm, I'm drawing so many parallels to uh, musician talks that I've heard or interviews where they're really kind of talking about the same thing in the context of going and performance, you know, going and performing. But uh, that's exactly, you know, what happens when you sit down to the console as well. So very cool. Okay, uh, this one is from Sebastian, and he says, Hi, Manny, thanks so much for sharing your experiences with us. I want to ask you about your amazing low end and vocals work. Can you share with us what are your two approach or what are your approaches to these two topics? <laughs> so it's funny because uh, I mixed going back to Kanye, uh, an album, 808s and the Heartbreak, right? And, and everyone's like, What'd you do to the 808s on that album? I'm like, absolutely nothing. <laughs> Put up the Vader. <laughs> you don't need to do anything to do with So I don't know if it's a trick or, you know, you know um, how you color, right? Like the art of EQing, right? To me, it's like coloring, like, uh, you know, separation. I, we talked about it briefly where you, hope you go to a, like a Picasso and there's, you know, the cubist movement. It was very defined. Lines were very, very defined. It could be one color on this side of the line and not a completely different color on the other side of that line. And then you go to someone like a Renoir, right, where everything seems to kind of blend in, you know, there's no separation, clear separation. I see that as EQing because sometimes you want a separation between instruments, you know, and, I, and you got to have a very clear separation. Other times you want glue, right? You want this this thing to just kind of blend all together. Understanding both approaches and, and techniques. I promise you guys I'm going to turn my do not disturb thing. <laughs> well, I think you probably just got the same email I did from Mix with the Masters. So oh, it's all. Okay. It's all. <laughs> so, so we, uh, so, so my, my thing is learn how to EQ and learn how to uh, do both techniques on separation and glue. Uh, and I think that to me is what, you know, that's how we create emotions, right? That's how we create, uh, you know, glue and dance uh, to an alternative record or the complete opposite from a hip hop record where it's all the Picasso where you have separate lines for, for different colors. So um, some people see EQs, you know, music and colors, right? Like I tend to, whether I learn maybe the SSL colors. I don't know what it is, but I try to associate every frequency to or piece of gear to a color. So if, if it doesn't matter what color it is, it's all subjective, right? So you can be like, my GML 8200 is is gonna be the top end is whatever that is. Could be a shape, could be anything. And 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 I know that if I'm lacking something like that, I have my arsenal is there where I know I can go to that sort of shape it could be or color you know and now you're coloring with those frequencies with different eqs from different manufacturers and learning those you know learning those uh, those colors is so important and it could be the same as with plugins right i mean plugins you know give you a different sort of characteristic to that i don't know if i answered his question but <laughs> <laughs> no i think no. definitely because it, it's impossible to say yeah. like oh here's what i do with low end but there was an interview i watched and i can't remember who it was with and i think we touched on it last time too but th this idea of the glue or the separation but it just like in the like take the kick snare relationship are they going to be like that are they going to be like that are they going to be like that yep, exactly and that tells you so much it's like well do you want the low end of the snare up with the mids of the kick or do you want to shave that off and let the kick own it and, and if you think about it if you look from this angle you're masking so and that could be a good thing it could be a bad thing there's no right or wrong with it but it's a great way to think about it but you know when so so going to like what do you do with the vocals and what do you do with the low end so going to that technique is i like to have my vocal as pure as possible like so that means that I start eat, I start coloring around that. So going back to the 808, like I don't do anything to the 808s. I honestly don't do anything, but I do color around the 808 so that so that the eight, the 808 kind of exists in its own sort of you know spectrum, I guess. And that's what I do with vocals as well. Now, are there techniques DSing and reverbs and delay? Yes, of course. There's a million different techniques, but. The fundamental way for me to to look 
at a new mix is like what's the purest form of that sound and let me try to keep it as pure as possible because then i don't have to work that hard it's know? a it's a really mm. important concept actually i mean because yes the the 808s already sounded great but you could easily have fucked that up by letting other things interfere with them so the mixing isn't for the thing that sounds great it's for all the other stuff that could get in the way yeah. in that instance and that's a big concept yeah and you know i always say like listen to what you're eqing things listen to what's around it like touching it and your point of uh like this yeah <laughs> yeah so how it's, it know, was more of like a gang sign probably but yeah <laughs> it's the worst but gang that, ever that's no no but that's exactly <laughs> what we're talking about separation of what that is and and when when you're for example if i if i have a vocal here and i bring maybe a synth and that immediately does this and it's fighting it then i know that i i have a choice do i what's my focal point and at this point is my vocal so therefore i'm going to color around that vocal with the synth and that's a so when i'm eqing that i'm listening to the vocal not the actual thing that i'm eqing so that's another right. way you know kind of look at it and and help help you shape you know and that uh I think give me an EQ, and I think that to me is the most powerful thing we have in the, in our world because you can separate, you can glue, you can do so many things on the, with EQ. Uh, you would think that compression uh, glues things together, and yes, a hundred percent, yes. But you can glue things with frequencies and without even using a compressor yet, you know. And once you have that, then you have a good foundation to your to your home that you're building, you know. So, but if you don't have that, then at some point, at any point, it could dis it, it could be completely destroyed because you don't have a good foundation. And I think also, like, I mean, if you think of frequency as sort of the bottom to top thing, but you're also the king of the front to back, moving stuff <laughs> out of the way with a little yes. bit of reverb, a little bit of delay and that kind of thing. You are so good at it and still having like you could have lots of effects on the vocal, but there's still lots of effects on other things as well. And everybody is out of each other's way, but yeah. working together. Yeah, you know, depth, that's a whole different conversation on how we can achieve depth. Yeah. Not only that, but take it a step further on depth within each section, right? Um, so we can mm. apply width, depth, height to every song, but imagine within the song, each section having the three different, you know, and how you manipulate that. Not for sonic purposes, but for that emotional roller coaster, yeah. right? Uh, that roller coaster has to have ups and downs, you know, it just can't be a, that, like I said last time, a continuous drop, you know, because then you'll be bored. Uh, how do you ride the roller coaster? How do you mind fuck uh, a listener into thinking that they're taking a mental break without even knowing it so that next section you have them again, you know, and, uh, and that's what's going to hit, make someone hit repeat. So there's a lot more psychology that goes into it. And, and we have the tools to hopefully apply some of those techniques so that uh, it's so that, again, we become invisible, but we will, but people want to hear the, that song again. You know? Yeah. And I think, again, another really good point is that it's easy to think that you'll get a mix to the point where, oh, it just plays itself. But section to section, things have got to change. Filters come in and out, effects come in and out, and hopefully you don't even notice. But yeah. the chorus hits, and that's that's a really important thing. And then that's when people tap their foot, they dance, they cry. And then now you've gotten an emotion. Of, and it's there, by the way. It's there. When we get the song, we're so lucky we get some of the best producers and artists, you know. And so we're a little, we're definitely blessed to have good quality content. But our job is to even give it almost a little steroid, a shot of steroids here and there, you know. So yeah, that can be exactly. That, an exaggerated emotion. An exaggerated yeah, like emotion. when you hear the rough and you think, oh, man, I really wish it did that. Well, you're not done till it does that. Yep, yep exactly. Yeah. exactly. Awesome. You got time for a couple awesome. more? Yeah, let's do it. Let's All right. Do it. Or to just talk about depth and mixes for hours. <laughs> no, no, That'd be no. great. You ask the questions <laughs> yeah, right. that are in the list, Mark. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, this next one is from Dormanville, and he asks, has there ever been a time when a mastered version of your mix did not come out to your liking, and what do you listen for when a song is mastered by a mastering engineer? So what do you listen for when it comes back? You know, early days of mastering were so frustrating because it's, uh, you know, mastering was, to me, a very creative um art form 
when that was, you know, 25 years ago, it was like, it was creative because they had the tools to make it loud and give it some life and, you know, things that we've been talking about. Now it's a level playing field because we have the same tools to make it loud, to make it exciting and all that. So, the, so I feel like mastering has become a different type of process, the, uh, you know, creative process. Now you don't need to slam it. You don't need to bring it up. You don't need to add width because of this, this and that. And so I feel like in the early days it was frustrating because you, you know, you hear, you, you work so, so long on a, a, a reverb trail that gave you a sense of, you know, whatever the emotion is. But, uh, you know, you put a limiter and that thing goes away in, in the a different type of emotion for that, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you have dynamics, you put a limiter and then the, the dynamic is not as much. It's not as exaggerated, just like what we were saying a few minutes ago. So um, that took, man, I feel like there was a transition of many years that I didn't like 95% of the masters that came back, you know? And it's very frustrating because you you become friends with all the mastering guys and it's tough to call them because the label's like, oh, no, it doesn't sound the same or it needs to sound. Can you just call them? And, of course, we're like the bad guys. We're like, hey, man, you know, can, can we just do less? And some get very protective and like, I'm not doing anything. I'm like, well, you kind of are because I can hear it. Uh, so it's gotten so much better. And I always say find a mastering engineer that understands your sound and what you're yep. going for. You know, as mm. opposed to bashing you know, or, or experimenting. I mean, yeah, you should always experiment. But just know that if you have your three or four people that really, really know your sound, really know what you're going for, really understand your low end and your dynamics, and, and some of them just sprinkle a little dust here and there, then it's fine. And that's all it should be. Now, look, if I'm a 22-year-old you know, year old mixer that doesn't really – that's still learning the process, then maybe a master, a good mastering person will help that, you know, but, you know, we have like the, not 10,000, but the 30,000 hours, which we've done it, we've done a lot. So there's a level of, you know, just experience that we have that we don't need that much help at the end process, you know? So those are the two buckets and then experience, you may really, really get some help for, from a mastering engineer. If you've done the 10,000 hours, you may need a lot less, and uh, and that's okay. So find yourself a mastering engineer that knows that about you. Yeah, you know? find someone who likes your mixes. That's the very first thing. And, <laughs> and But I think when it comes to, like, assessing the mastering, like how do you decide what to do about the mastering, the, whenever we talk about the emotion and things, it almost sounds like we're trying to not talk about the gear, but it's the only fucking thing that matters there was a record that i mixed and it got mastered and sonically it hadn't changed a whole lot they like they were pretty hands off with it and the artist said look i don't know what to do with this because like it's just only slightly different so how the hell do i even know and i just told her take the song just pick a song and just dance around the apartment while you listen to it and see which one is more fun to dance to. And it was like, bam, she knew immediately which version she wanted to use. Whereas when you sat and tried to be analytical, it was impossible to say, absolutely impossible. But when it was, how do I react to it? Absolutely no question. Yeah. And yeah, that's what's that's, important. Yeah, that's a great way to say it. Like, just, just feel it, right? I mean, you know, because we could analyze it. Oh, we, you know, but if we don't feel it, then what's the point? Yeah. It's huge. Okay. That was definitely a highlight that sentence moment, but we'll keep going. Uh, okay. So back to kind of reverbs a little bit. Uh, another question from OH3. How do you get to understand your reverbs? How do you understand the room that you want to put something in? Well, you know, there's this great reverb uh, called the uh, American reverb. <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> That's all you need. Uh, you know yeah. what? I, I, you know, it's it's like, how do you, why do you put delays and reverbs and some, you know, and I go back to what we've been talking about. Is it, you know, I always say, does it make it sound better or feel better, right? And most of the time it's one or the other. It's rare that it's both, but yeah. one. So for me, it's like, if I put a delay on something uh, that wasn't a production call, uh, you know, I'm 
constantly helping maybe the production. Maybe there's a gap. Maybe there's a synth that doesn't play. Maybe there's something that we can kind of mind, the, trick our minds into going and staying in the song. So I'll do that for, you know, to kind of help the production, you know, and uh, reverbs is emotion as well. Like, it, it, you know, there's maybe 20 things, maybe even more. Uh, and they go so fast that you do it almost subconsciously now because you've done it so many times. But what I would do if I were to slow the process down is like, okay, what are the lyrics like? Who is the artist? Is it an established artist? Is it a new artist? Did they try at, at what point of their career? Is this a fuck you moment for an artist or is this a vulner, vulnerable moment? And you take all that information and all that data and it kind of answers that question for you, you know? So I'm not one to just put reverb just because the vocal needs reverb. There's got to be a good reason and it's got to be like to the point that you brought up like, hey, dance around and see which one makes you dance, you know, better or more or whatever well that's kind of like the same thing it's like close your eyes and what, what does that add to that emotion and if it does then fuck then stick with it if it gets in the way then you're doing it for a sonic purpose and for me again it's not it's gonna sound weird for me i'm not interested so much in sonics as much as people would think you know i'm just not i mean because i've done i've mixed records 20 years ago that i thought so sounded amazing and I listen to it a few years later and sound they sound like shit, you know, but I know, yeah. I, but I've done worked on records that I felt this emotion 20 years ago. And if I play that record again, I get the same fucking emotion. So right there just proves that we're not here to make things sound better. Uh, that's a big misconception of what we do. Hopefully we're here to hopefully make it feel something, you know, that's what me, that's why we all got into this because music makes us feel a certain thing and way not because we love 10k you know uh, on the hi-hat or, or 7k on the vocal or we take you know 400 off a kick that doesn't matter it's like you know we did it because we love how it makes us feel and how and it's and it's an art form that transports you to that moment in time so that's what we try to do i mean that's what uh, how i pick reverbs delays what reverbs do i pick is it something that's going to help the production and make a list of what those things are and with the, again going back to the 10,000 hours hopefully with time you'll spend less time analyzing and more your gut telling you you know and that's that's where we all want to be at where the gut kind of i always say the gut should mix the song not your you know not your head but real quickly you boost 10k on a hi-hat 7k on a vocal and you take <laughs> 400 hertz out of the kick all right we got that <laughs> next question <laughs> all right i think yeah look it's there are so many songs that are super powerful with a bone dry vocal and then there's songs that are super powerful with a ton of reverb on the vocal one thing i would say if you're trying to learn reverbs is like if you work in pro tools revive comes with pro tools it's a great sounding reverb it's free and it's a modeling reverb so it does springs it does rooms it does everything so just stick with that one for a minute don't like oh i need 500 plugins and whatever and then i would say a plugin like yours is awesome because otherwise what happens otherwise is you just start thinking about reverb and you don't think about pre and post processing the reverb like DSing going into a reverb well that's sort of obvious filtering going into the reverb oh yeah 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 but distorting after the reverb so you can actually hear it that's really important if you've got a dense track you need a shitty reverb you don't need a good reverb exactly, exactly. and you got to learn that that's where you go to the D verb and exactly i look i've got two vocal reverbs in my template and one of them is D verb and the other one changes all the time exactly exactly love it yeah so awesome. should we do one, uh, one more yeah let's do one more all right great okay uh another great question from oh3 and a good one to end on what could you say in your whole time as an engineer was the most eye-opening thing that made you understand the process more? Wow. Wait, ask that again, because that's actually a, one, one of those deep, like, let me think about. Like, yeah. yeah, it might be unanswerable. So what could you say in your whole time as an engineer was the most eye-opening thing that made you understand the process more? You know, it's it's funny because we've been actually talking about it for the last couple hours. Like, you know, there's moments, you know, going back to the Alicia moment, going back to I know we'll talk about a John Mayer moment, the Kanye moment. I mean, I think there's 
honestly, I don't think we've, um, you know, it's, it's, it just, it's, a, it's evolving at all times. So I don't know if I, honestly, if I even have an answer for that, it's just, you know, it could be something as simple as, you know, just listening to music, really listening to music and being a music fanatic. I think what happens in our, as a mixer, and I just joked about being a fixer at times, uh, you know, we forget how to be music fans, you know, and uh, and I think if if anything, the realization, the constant reminder of be, having to be, not just wanting to be, having and wanting to be a music fan still when your hectic days of 12 hour day mix, you still should be a music fan. And I think that that will get you out of trouble throughout your career. If you remind yourself like, man, you know what, whenever I hear when the levee breaks, that brings me back to a, a moment in my life that I want to sort of recreate, you know? Uh, when I hear, you know, Umbrella, something that I worked on and, and I remember the emotion that I had that day as a music fan, not as a mixer, um, and those will get you out of trouble. And though that those moments will, you know, I, I do think you should have a playlist that says, if you're depressed, what songs would you play? You know, like, uh, and and when you're depressed, fucking play those songs. You know, and guess what? Next day you're gonna go in the studio clear headed because you're not depressed anymore. You're in the right state of mind. So we forget how powerful music is and how influential it is. And uh, if I were to say even though we talked about specific times in my career, uh, but if I were to say what's the best way to become a better mixer is just by reminding your, yourself on how to be a fan, you know, because you learn more from from that than anything else. So, well, I and I I think it also goes back to what you're saying really early on tonight about having the confidence but not the arrogance. But it's it's being open to the moments that do happen. It would have been very easy to dismiss Alicia as some young girl who just doesn't know what the fuck's going on because you tune vocals, man. Instead of it being this absolute life changing moment. So you just it being open to it is what's important. The lesson itself almost doesn't matter. It's the ability to be open to getting that input and changing on the fly and doing it yourself without people having to tell you like, dude, did you not notice you should have done this? <laughs> right yeah. yeah that's it man people are yelling preach in the comments over here. <laughs> it's just like it's yeah. like a motivational speaking thing for mix engineers yeah this manny amazing. this is <laughs> awesome again so i'm going to immediately get in touch and we're going to find another monday do it i'm down i'm down get part I love three we might get done with part four before the end of the year at this rate so that's yeah. good do it. I'd love it. like i said if people are interested then let's go they are interested there's no question. And we've only made it up to 2005. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Well, thank you guys. Always. You're su such a great time with you guys. So, uh, yeah, let's do, let's knock it out in a couple of weeks. All right. Awesome, man. I will be in touch. Awesome. So we will now wave and I'll mute and go to the thanks.